Hey, and welcome back to Alchemist Camp, where we learn Elixir by building things. This is a solution to challenge number four, which was a bit different of one. This is just a math problem, basically. Uh, Fibonacci numbers are numbers where each number in the sequence is equal to the previous two added together. So one plus one is two, two plus one is three, and then we get five and eight, 13, so on. So the goal was to find the 45th Fibonacci number, then have a look at the docs and figure out how to make a function to time your function or just figure out a way to time your function. So let's start by making a file, fib.ex, and we'll call this module fib. Oops, not a macro, a module. There we go, we'll call it fib. And function, we'll call the first one naive because this is going to be a very naive approach to figuring out the Fibonacci number. So from the definition, we said each number is equal to the two previous to it added together. So that's pretty easy to make a function out of. Uh, the one two before it plus the one one before it and we have to handle the base case of course otherwise this will just keep calling itself with smaller and smaller and smaller ends until it goes well it'll never get to negative infinity but that's the direction it would go uh, so we're just going to handle integers for this case um, the First number is going to be one. Let's make this a one-liner function because it's uh, it, there's really not much to it. Let me hold Shift and Alt and hit down, and that'll copy the line. And the second number in the list is also one. All right, let's give this a shot in IEX. First, we'll compile the module, and then we will. Try our function on a small number, so we get an idea of five, eight, thirteen. Yep. Okay, looks good. Uh, we said the goal was to test this on forty-five. Do that. Now I know because uh, I picked the number forty-five, and I have an idea how fast my computer is and how much stuff I've got running on it, but this is really pushing it this is so this, this is obviously doing a lot more calculations than it looks like it was and i'm just going to let it run and we'll analyze the complexity of this function so whatever n you pick it's going to call two numbers previous to it and say we're call, n is five so it's going, this branch is going to calculate Fibonacci number of three. Oh, it just finished now. You can see it's a very big number. And this branch would calculate the Fibonacci of four. Each of these branches are going to call this naive function again. And this one that's calculating the Fibonacci number of four will calculate the number uh, the, the Fibonacci number of two less than that, so it'll be Fibonacci number of two and the one of three. This branch, which is to calculate the Fibonacci number of three, we'll call it once with one, once with two, and they'll each hit the base case. The second iteration of this one, so this one was calling four initially, half of, of its, its, or not half of, but one of the two calculations it called was to do Fibonacci of three, so it's really crazy, like we're repeating the previous calls again and again and again. And if you think about it, you can see that for any Fibonacci number, if, if you calculate the Fibonacci number n, calculating Fibonacci number of n plus two is more than twice as expensive because to calculate Fibonacci of n plus two, you're going to calculate the Fibonacci of n already is half of that and then the other half is to calculate the 
Fibonacci of n plus 1, which is even more. So every 2 you increase n by, you more than double the number of calculations in order to figure this out. So obviously that's not the most uh, efficient way to go about things. And the way to get around this with most programming languages would just be to have a couple of variables where you're storing the, uh, the running totals as you loop through the numbers. Since Elixir is immutable and we don't have a way of storing things in variables, we have to use a different strategy. And what we do is we, we basically simulate that through tail recursion. Tail recursion is where you have a function that calls itself, but every time it calls itself, it's changing the parameters. And in those parameters, it's storing part of the, the information to solve the problem. So we'll make this function called faster. And there'll be a few cases, but the basic idea I'll show you first is we have the number n, as always. Then we have two parameters that I'll call accumulators, accumulator one and accumulator two. And each loop through this, it will call itself, but it's only calling itself one time, not two times. It's gonna call itself and pass n minus one. And instead of accumulator one, it's going to pass accumulator two's data to become the new accumulator one and accumulator one plus accumulator two will become the new accumulator two so let me put a base case on here once you get to zero actually no once you get to one then accumulator two will have the answer. So I've put underscore before accumulator one. That means we just don't use this argument. It, it is an argument to the function, but we don't use it. So it's got an underscore. And once we get to this base case, accumulator two has the whole answer. And there's one more thing we need, which is the function to start everything off. Uh, where you just because we we need to be able to just say get me the Fibonacci number in position n so That would be this function and the way it starts it off is it calls the main one which is on line 10 with n and the initial value of the first accumulator is 0 the initial value of the second one is 1 so this might look a little confusing if you haven't done much with tail recursion before. So we'll just go through a quick example so you can see what happens. Let's say we call this function with three. It will go here, n will be three, first accumulator is zero, second one is one. Then it will call itself passing two, one and zero plus one which is also one and that time through it will call itself again passing n equal one and the second accumulator is now one i'm sorry the first accumulator is now one because the second one was one and the second one is now two because the first and second were both two then the last trip through n is equal to one and we ignore the first accumulator and the second one is two and you can see how if it went through another trip every trip through we're, we're essentially just moving down that sequence because the first accum accumulator gets the value the second one used to have and the second one gets the value that it used to have plus the one that the first one used to have so we're just merging down down the tree and in this case in order to calculate the Fibonacci of a really big n we're only going through each one once we're not 
branching off into twice as many or more than twice as many calculations every time we increase the, the number of n by 2. So we'll give this one a try. Recompile and now fib dot faster faster of 45 is undefined because I forgot to hit control s and save it okay and that was almost instantaneous and you can see we could add a huge number here it's still almost instantaneous that's because this is this is growing at big O of n time it means as you increase the number of n the amount of time goes up roughly proportional to n as opposed to our naive implementation which is going up in exponential time all right let's add a timer so to do this we can use the time module in uh, in Erlang or no in, in Elixir and we're going to get an initial time I'll call t0 and set that to time.utc underscore now and then we're going to call the function passed in this looks a little strange we put a dot before the parentheses that's because it's an anonymous function that we passed in and then we call time.diff on time.ut time.utc now and this is going to be a new now it's going to be the current time after the function has run t0 and we have to give time.diff a, a measure of time it could be seconds although that's not really enough so we'll make it milliseconds and that should do it and then in order to use this time function we're going to have to pass it um, you know we'll just make a compare that's probably the easiest way so compare and the default value of compare is going to be 40 45 is, is really pushing it on on this computer io.put naive and then however much time it took and we can't well we could pass in naive open paren 40 close paren but the problem with that is it's going to just calculate the uh, the value and then go to the time function the calculations will all be done so it won't record how long it took so we're going to use this syntax naive this is how you pass an anonymous function with one argument this is actually the same kind of syntax that we've seen with uh, um, with the, the terser syntax we've used in uh, um, say like in enum.map or enum.reduce and then we'll pass n into the function because the function is actually calling the argument this is not a generalized time function this assumes you have a function with one argument which is fine for us then we will do the same thing for faster capital F faster small f faster and after reporting both of those things we'll end the function and we'll give this a try <clears throat> recompile all looks good uh, we'll do fib.compare. Pass it no arguments, so it'll be 40. And it looks like the naive version took 3.8 seconds, and the faster one took less than one second. Uh, we'll try it with 42. So this should be more than twice as long, based on uh, the reasoning that I explained earlier in the video. and it is the naive version took about 10 seconds and the faster one was still less than one second 
So looks like the mathematical reasoning earlier in the video was correct, or at least in the right direction. And we've covered this problem pretty well. So let's do a quick recap. We've looked at how to use accumulators to improve the performance of a function that would otherwise be very expensive. And this is a very, very common technique when you're dealing with pure functions. By pure, I mean functions that uh, don't save any information anywhere or change anything. It's just you give them an input and there's an output. And we've also looked at the time module, or at least time.utc now and time.diff. And we did a little bit of uh, instrumentation to compare how long different, uh, different approaches took. And this is a really useful thing you can do. You can even use this to figure out what the time complexity of some piece of your program is if you don't know. And you know, you can just look at how long it takes with an n of one size, then try you know a slightly bigger n or an n that's twice as big, and you'll be able to figure out with not too many tests usually. So it's pretty useful. Speaking of useful, if you want to learn more useful things, subscribe to this YouTube channel.